We're outside the Boston Convention Center where you can see the city in the background and I've corralled Professor Myra McClure from Imperial College London. Thanks for coming outside Thank here you. to talk with me. You've just given a, a talk about XMRV, the new human retrovirus, and I was hoping you could clarify it with the issues around it for us. Uh, this was a virus originally identified in prostate tumors and since then has been identified initially in some chronic fatigue syndrome patients, mm. but in other studies not. So can you briefly summarize the pluses and minus and give us your understanding of that? Of the chronic fatigue story? Yeah. Or, or, well, let's or, start or, with chronic fatigue syndrome. Sure. Okay, well, uh, we, we are not chronic fatigue syndrome specialists, nor do we have a research interest in that. But we got involved in this story because we had started to develop assays to look at the prevalence of XMRV in prostate cancer, because that's where the virus was discovered. Uh, Bob Silverman's group had discovered it a few years previously, and Ila Singh's group had then shown that it wasn't dependent on a genetic uh, um, malfunction of uh, the RNA cell gene, but uh, was found in all forms of, can of prostate cancer. So it looked to us as if XMRV might be becoming a big player in prostate cancer. So we immediately thought, is this virus to be found in prostate cancer in the UK? And we developed these assays despite the fact that there had been two groups in, um, in Ireland and one in Germany who had failed to find XMRV in prostate cancer patients of their own. But uh, there was one, Nicole Fischer, who had found at least one sample, very low prevalence in Germany. So armed with these, uh, these assays that we, we produced and having got our ethics permission, to look at uh, uh, prostate cancer samples that we had in store in the hospital. We started to look for these. And then the science paper was published. And a man who was, who was unknown to me, and in fact I still haven't met him yet, a man called Simon Wesley, who is professor of psychiatry at King's College, a neighboring institution in London, had emailed our director of uh, research for our faculty and said, have you seen this paper? Um, and do you have the tools to check out my patients? And uh, this guy, Jonathan Weber, said, well, I don't know much about this virus, but Myra's been fiddling with it, as he put it, in the laboratory, and she would probably have the tools to help you. So we did. We took DNA from patients that he had, 186 of them, and we went into this uh, small collaboration, which only take a few weeks, with the intention of corroborating the science paper's findings, because that would have revolutionized the way he treated his patients. And uh, to our disappointment, of course, we didn't find the virus. And then uh, there was a lot of, uh, lot of publicity surrounding the fact that we couldn't uh, corroborate the science paper. And then there followed several other papers, one from the National Institute of uh, Medical Research in Mill Hill, a good uh, laboratory, um, who confirmed our own findings, that they couldn't find it in their own uh, chronic fatigue patients. And then there was a third paper from Frank Kuperfeld's department in the Netherlands. Again, he couldn't find it in his uh, sample. But the one we all waited for, of course, was the one from CDC, um, because that was an American group, and you couldn't, you couldn't argue, well, maybe this is a, a, an American phenomenon and they just don't have the virus in England. So the CDC paper came out and again, they couldn't find it. So we, we, we rather felt that uh, the onus is on the science people to prove that they can find it rather than the rest of us who can't. Does that help clarify sure. where we and are at the minute? You're using PCR to detect the We're using sequences. PCR initially. It was proviral PCR because uh, we were given the DNA. So we couldn't attempt to isolate or anything of the kind. But we've, since we published, we've done some serological assays. Mm -hmm. Now, these are not assays which are specific for XMRV because uh, at the time we didn't have the recombinant proteins to do that. But um, we sent our serum to a man called Dr. Shozo Izui in Geneva who works on xenotropic neuroendocrine viruses. He had some ELISAs going and um, he had two uh, such uh, uh, assays. We sent them out blinded to him and included some normal controls and again he wasn't able to find any positives. Of course there was a weakness in our, in our whole assay because we didn't have a human positive to right. act as our positive right. control. So we used mouse, uh, human, mouse serum. In fact no study has had a 
known positive human control yet. Except the original. Except the original uh -huh. one. Mm -hmm. And that would probably help uh, everyone if, if that were part of the study. Of course it would. Even the most recent study, which I'm sure you know of, the ALTER study, which was published very recently, and which did find proviral DNA and some viral RNA mm -hmm. in blood, uh, they didn't have a, a known positive control as well. They didn't have a known positive control. It's important, I think, to point out that they haven't found the same virus either. Right. They have found another uh, member of the mm -hmm. uh, family of endogenous retroviruses. Right. This is a polytropic as opposed to a xenotropic uh, right. virus. So what does that mean, that humans can be infected readily with mouse virus? Well, it's funnily, you know, up until this point, mm -hmm. gamma retroviruses, which is the genus to which XMRV belongs, have never been known to infect human populations. Mm -hmm. They're a group of animal viruses, some of which cause leukemia in their natural hosts. But this is the first time that a gamma retrovirus has been connected, not just with one human disease, but with two. So that in itself is quite interesting. I suppose it remains to be seen whether we all are harboring right. murine leukemia virus uh, sequences in our genome or whether it's a subpopulation for some reason or other. A number of months ago, Steve Goff told me that years ago when investigators transplanted human tumors into mice, they often became infected. Absolutely. So that showed that human cells at least could be infected with human this virus. But the, the, the corollary of that is that when people were doing things like cancer research in the 70s and they put human cell lines into nude mice, immunodeficient mice, or human tumors, most mice harbor XMLV, xenotropic neural leukemia virus infection. Right. So the tumors right. and the cells picked up this infection. Right. Then when they were propagated in the laboratory again, of course, people thought they were isolating a new human virus, which was associated to whatever cancer they were looking at. But in fact, it wasn't. It was just the mouse cell. Right. Right so, I mean, retrovirologists, as you know, have got to be very careful. Sure. The other source of... Uh, problematic source of possible contamination are hybridomas. They secrete not only monoclonal antibodies, but, um, you know, xenotropic neural yeah. leukemia viruses. Sure. So even if you're not using them directly in the lab, you might be using a reagent which has been purified using a monoclonal. So you've got to be really stringent to make sure that you're not mm -hmm. just picking up an old friend. Yeah. Now, one of the statements in the Alter paper that I didn't understand. Uh -huh. Maybe you can explain. They looked at the glycogag sequence yes. of the alter yes. virus versus the original yes. XMRV, and they said there was a hundred percent sequence identity yeah. with a lab with a virus from a lab strain. I know mice. this glycogag is a, a, a glycoprotein. It's the um, carbohydrate on the the gag protein, right. and it seems to have some sort of impact on the pathogenesis of MLV. Yeah. Um, I didn't quite understand what the relevance was in that paper to glycogag, but there was a sequence homology to... Yes, yeah, so the, the virus, both the polytropic that Walter detected as well as the original XMRV, That's right. They both... They both express, have this. And uh, the Walter virus has a 9 base deletion and the XMRV has 24. That's right. It's certainly not XMRV. I mean, it very yes. much belongs yes. to the polytropic uh, family. And that in itself is a little bizarre. I mean, why would two sets of patients in different parts of America segregate according to what assays that you're using? Sure, sure. I mean, that's a little, little strange. But it seems that now both, I mean, in both cases, there seems to be this virus in a certain fraction of people, even in yeah, healthy people. Yeah, even in healthy people. So where might it have come from? Could it, is it, do you think it's from a laboratory? I know that it's always possible that it could be contamination, but if it, it represents a real infection, could it have come from a lab mouse? If it represents a real infection, it could have come from a lab mouse. It's unlikely, I think, to have come from a mouse to a human. It's more likely, mm -hmm. recently, it's more likely to have come from another human who has somehow been infected by mouse uh, sequences previously. Right. Right. Um, but you know, we've lived for thousands of years very close to our mice. Maybe the surprising thing is that we we haven't found mouse sequences before. We've always just assumed that there, there are mechanisms whereby right. we keep us infection free from, right. from neuron leukemia viruses. And actually, that's something I still don't understand. There are innate mechanisms which are at play that have been overruled to allow us to be, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to be infected by these viruses. So that's, that's a little bit odd. So it could be that a certain fraction of humans have these myriad viruses. They're fine. 
but under certain conditions, chronic fatigue syndrome, prostate cancer, they replicate unchecked. In the prostate cancers, it does seem to be that this is a very real infection for the reason that when they've taken XMRV out and grown it in the lab in human cells, the integration sequences flanking the, the integration of the virus into the human genome are human sequences right. and not mouse. Right. I mean, I think until the same experiments have been done with chronic fatigue uh, patients, mm -hmm. I, I, I would, you can't really say that this right. is a real infection. So, um, in, in Alter's paper, he suggested that perhaps the fact that the glycogag is slightly different might have influenced the PCR study. Possibly. In other labs. Do you have any plans to go back and use primers? Similar well, we to don't this? have to because when we set up our PCR, mm -hmm. we did it with two primer sets. One which was specific for XMRV, and that encompassed the 24 base pace deletion that you were talking about that's specific for XMRV. And another set which we reckoned would, would pick up or amplify all known MLVs mm -hmm. from a very highly conserved region, which was in the Paul gene, the breast transcriptase. So had that polytropic virus been there, we should have picked that up. And the CDC, likewise, they used MLV generic primers, and they didn't pick it up either. So. You know, there's no point in me going back. I just get the same so result. You have no plans to revisit those samples at the moment? No, I have no plans to revisit those samples because I'm quite confident of the result and the result that we would get. What I have plans for doing, at least I've, I emailed my collaborator this week after the XMRV meeting, is to say, look, we've never looked at fresh samples. And the argument which Judy Mikovits would put forward is, you've all looked by PCR and serology, but you haven't tried to grow the virus in culture. Right. Now, most retrovirologists would say, all right, we'll do a quick PCR first on our tissue, and if it's positive, then we'll try and go back to the patient, get fresh tissue, and we'll grow out. And that's what we're doing with our prostate cancers. We get fresh biopsies, we do a quick PCR to see if it's positive for XMRV, and if it is, then we would go back and try and isolate virus. But uh, we haven't had any, any positives. Nevertheless, in the interest of science, mm -hmm. I've asked if we can get a few um, fresh samples, fresh blood samples from chronic fatigue patients and following all the recommendations which are now coming out from the Whitmore Peterson and we're getting a sort of drip fed little uh, hints of how to do it, then I'm very happy to try and I'm very happy to say all right by this method we can find it if we can find it. But I, ha you know, I, have, uh, I have doubts about that. Do you think in the end it will, and obviously this is a story that needs to go on for, for some years yet before we understand in the end, will, could it be that some chronic fatigue patients and perhaps even some prostate cancer patients are, have this virus as a causative agent, but others don't? I think prostate cancer is a whole new ball game. I don't think the two are, are running in parallel at the minute. I don't, um, I, I don't think this is going to take years to do, to do this. I mean, already at the first conference for XMRV, there is real willingness to exchange samples, to have panels of uh, uh, blinded samples, to share these among key laboratories to see what their findings are. I mean, I reckon, I, and you know, at this conference, the head of the NIH was there, and there is real, a real determination to find out once and for all if this is a laboratory contaminant or if this is, is real. And I think we'll know by this time next year with Within a bit a of year. luck. I would hope so. Uh -huh. I think um, it's a fascinating story. Uh, it's a new, it seems to be a new human retrovirus. Mm. And any new virus in people is, is always interesting. Oh, it's no fascinating. It yes. So I look forward to seeing what's going on in all the labs. So do we. And thank you for coming outside and talking. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. <laughs>